Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Joey Lustre and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London. And thanks everyone for joining this uh, linguistics webinar this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we have two speakers for today's uh, webinar. One is Lindell Broham, who's Broham, who's probably the first biologist to speak at uh, SOAS linguistics webinar. Um, she's affiliated with the Research School of Biology at the Australian National University. Uh, and the Macroevolution and Macroecology Lab, where they study macroevolutionary patterns and mechanisms. Linnell has a long list of publications and many awards, uh, including the Eureka Prize for Interdisciplinary Scientific Research, which was won with other people in collaboration with our other speaker, Felicity Meekins, who is a linguist uh, at the ARC Center of Excellence for Dynamics of Languages and the School of Languages and Cultures at the University of Queensland. Felicity is well known for describing languages of Northern Australia, uh, including working at four dictionaries, two grammars, two ethnobiologies, and was recently recognized with the Linguistic Society of America's Kenneth Hale Award for Linguistic Fieldwork. Uh, I also know Felicity's work through her collaboration with Jennifer Green and Fanny Turpin on a textbook, Understanding Linguistic Fieldwork, which I would recommend to anyone teaching fieldwork. Uh, but invited both of these speakers here today because of their work on a paper in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution called Global Predictors of Language Engagement and the future of linguistic diversity. So I look forward to hearing more about that research and related topics from them today. So with that, let me hand it over to you to speak. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much. Uh, now, how do I get the shared screen? Can everyone see the slides or is that? There should be that green icon again. You'd have to click it again to go through that. Okay. Right, is that working? Yes. Right, and this is a uh, this is a picture of Molonglo River, which runs through Ngunnawal country, uh, as a marker for me to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming to you from, which is Ngunnawal country, the area surrounding um, Canberra, the Australia's national capital. So I pay my respects to the traditional elders, uh, the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal Ngambri Ngarrago people. Um, so. As has been pointed out, it might be a, a bit unusual to have a biologist speaking to a linguistics um, series. Uh, I'm going to start today with looking at broad scale patterns of diversity and uh, endangerment. And then Felicity is going to follow on with some um, micro level stuff on change in populations. But we actually are following in a long tradition of biologists and linguists working together. Uh, this goes back a long way, particularly to the start of evolutionary biology. Um, Darwin famously recognised that um, there are many similarities between language evolution and biological evolution, and very often we might ask the same questions of both or use the same tools to understand both. And in fact, Darwin's work uh, inspired Albert Schleicher, who had already been working on language evolution. This is his groundbreaking Indo-European phylogeny. Um, but like uh, Darwin, many of the early evolutionary biologists actually use language evolution as an exemplar to make the Darwinian hypothesis more convincing. One of the problems with uh, evolution of species is it's so slow that it's you don't really see it happening. And so uh, many people like Darwin and Lyle and others use language change as a convincing case uh, for evolution, gradual evolution. And indeed, Schleicher here is saying that in many cases, language evolution will form um, a better way to demonstrate uh, the Darwinian hypothesis than species will. So biologists and linguists have always had this common ground, recognizing uh, common principles, and we can also share some useful analytical tools. So it's certainly ripe for interdisciplinary exchange. And the reason that I got involved in um, language evolution studies is because I found that often as a biologist, I was asking similar kinds of questions to those interested in language change might ask. Um, for example, how does individual level variation contribute to population change? What influences rates and patterns of change? Why are there some hotspots of diversity? And in particular, biologists have spent decades developing analytical tools to answer these kinds of questions, because very often the, the way you approach these analytically is actually a lot more complicated than it first appears. 
Um, and today we're going to illustrate this with some population models of change over time, which Felicity will talk about. And then I'm going to look at these more macroecological and macroevolutionary uh, comparative methods. And the reason we uh, use biological tools for these is because it's easy to get misled if you don't use the right analysis. So take, for example, the very broad scale diversity of languages over the globe. Now, if you show this map of number of languages per unit area to a biologist, it would be instantly recognizable to them because it looks like a map of biodiversity. So for example, if you plotted bird species diversity over the globe, obviously it's not exactly the same, but you'll see that the areas of high diversity for species will tend to also be areas of high diversity for languages. So why is that? Um, if we want to ask questions about what's causing these broad scale patterns, we do need uh, a fairly sophisticated analytical toolkit, otherwise we can be led astray by non-causal relationships. And to illustrate some of the possible pitfalls, uh, let's consider one hypothesis that has been put forward linking biodiversity and language diversity, which is that biodiversity causes language diversity. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my screen. Um, through a particular kind of biodiversity, which is parasite diversity. Uh, because parasites show the same sorts of biodiversity patterns as other species. So what have parasites got to do with language diversity? Well, a hypothesis published by uh, a number of people, including Randy Thornhill and Corey Fincher, is, is that if you live in an area with a high parasite load, well, um, populations that will limit their contact with their neighbours will also limit the chance of infection from neighbours and therefore this will promulgate um, a cultural isolation which will lead to language diversity uh, through um, isolation of communities and you can see that if you plot the number of languages per country against the number of infectious diseases you get this striking relationship. But the problem is um, that Parasites, like most species diversity, show a latitudinal diversity gradient. There's more of them in the tropics. And languages also have a latitudinal diversity gradient. And of course, anything with a latitudinal diversity gradient will correlate with everything else that varies with latitude. And so it's actually very easy to generate uh, these significant correlations uh, because so many variables correlate together. Now, it's not just a matter of throwing latitude into the analysis or something like that. Um, and the next example I'll show you will hopefully illustrate that problem. Now, this example may not uh, immediately be obvious why it's connected to language diversity, but stay with me because it will connect it eventually. All right, so why is it that when we think about spicy food, we associate it with hot countries, whereas cold countries often have blander food? Well, a hypothesis that was published um, a few decades ago was that if you live in an area with high temperature, uh, then you have high risk of foodborne infection. And so any culture that adds antimicrobials to their cooking uh, will do rather better. And many spices have antimicrobial properties. Okay, so that's all well and good. And indeed, if you collect um, recipe data from around the world, um, and you add up the average number of spices per recipe, you do indeed see this uh, very clear relationship. However, uh, if you ever see a graph where the data points are countries or areas or cultures uh, plotted against some kind of environmental thing, alarm bells should ring. Why? Because you can clearly see from this that there's clusters on this graph related um, cultures cluster together, nearby countries cluster together. And in fact, that's all you need to generate this relationship. The fact that uh, a near, your nearby neighbours tend to have similar cultures, similar cuisines and similar environments to you is enough to generate this relationship. And if you take into account the relatedness between cultures and the proximity between them, there is no significant association with temperature and spice above and beyond what you get for free just by the fact that nearby cuisines tend to be more similar. So there's no significant relationship between temperature and spices, nor is there between um, spice use and parasite load. However, there are some significant correlates of spice use above and beyond the relationship you get for free from close relatives and near neighbours. For example, 
spice use is significantly related to the number of per capita deaths on the road. And this is important because it's already been shown that linguistic diversity is related to road accidents. So you can see we're, we're connecting these things up now. Language diversity is related to spice use. So we have a new hypothesis, which is if you live in a hot country, you eat a lot of spicy food, it causes you to have traffic accidents and somehow this generates language diversity. Okay, so obviously this is a silly example. But the reason I put it in here is because it's actually very, very easy to generate significant correlations between cultural traits, linguistic diversity, environmental traits, economic traits, all of these things correlate together. So the reason I'm putting these examples up is to show you that we can't use simple analyses because if we do, we will get led astray by non-causal relationships. So we have to use a slightly more sophisticated uh, analytical toolkit. So here's another example, um, which is that uh, one hypothesis that's been put forward for, I'm sorry, I've, I can see a hand raised there. Does someone want to ask a question? I don't have the chat, so it's in the, shall I go ahead and um, we can Yeah, let's make time for question. questions at the end, yep. Yeah, okay, so we'll leave that one to the end. So anyway, here's another example of a hypothesis for language diversity. And this is um, that if you live somewhere with long growing season, so you can grow or gather food for more of the year, then the hypothesis is that smaller groups can be self-sufficient. Um, they can exist in a smaller area. They don't need to rely on their neighbors. Uh, therefore, you can jam more independent cultures into an area. And this leads to language diversity. But again, whenever you see a graph where there's countries plotted against some environmental variable, alarm bells should ring. Again, you can see here there's very strong geographic and cultural clustering. Why is this a problem? Because we can imagine there's a whole lot of things, for example, that these countries up in this top end of the graph, the Melanesian countries, differ in a whole lot of ways, not just language diversity and climate, um, but many other aspects as well. And they'll differ from the, the cultures down the other end of the graph, the Middle Eastern countries, which have short growing seasons and low language diversity. So we can never treat countries or areas or grid cells as independent data sets because neighboring countries and related cultures will be similar in so many different aspects that it will be very hard to tease apart causal relationships. Right, just one more example here um, to show you um, that this applies even when you're using grid cells as opposed to countries. So New Guinea, of course, is a, uh, an area of great language diversity. It's also an area of high species diversity. And if you plot language diversity and species diversity on a map, you see similar patterns. But intriguingly, if you plot threatened species and threatened languages, you get opposite patterns. Why threatened mammal species tend to be more concentrated in the highlands, perhaps because there's a, you know, a long period of agriculture and hunting at high density, whereas threatened languages tend to be more on the lowlands. Why? Well, it could be malaria, which is not, tend to, doesn't tend to be in the highlands. It could be the influence of colonisers on the lowland areas. Um, but in any case, there are these two distinct patterns. Mammals in the highlands, threatened mammals in the highlands, threatened languages in the lowlands. Now, if you take every one of these grid cells as an independent test of the association between threatened species and threatened languages, then every time you draw a grid from the lowlands, you'll find that it has high language loss, low mammal threat. Every time you take a square from the highlands, you'll find the opposite. And so you will generate a significant relationship just by sampling the same observation over and over and over again, even if there's actually no connection between the two. And in fact, when you take into account the spatial connections between the grid cells, there is no relationship. So these examples are just there to illustrate that when we look for patterns of diversity or patterns of endangerment, we have to uh, include as many possible co-varying um, features as we can. We've got to account for the fact that neighbours will tend to be more similar to each other, and we have to account for the relatedness between cultures. So taking these um, into account, we wanted to start by asking 
what drives global patterns of language diversity? Because we've got to understand the patterns of language diversity before we can uh, tackle patterns of language endangerment. And of course, we have to control for co-variation proximity and relatedness. So we gathered um, variables that represent, global variables that represent the ease of movement across the landscape. So altitude, roughness, river density. We gathered variables that uh, are climatic variables known to correlate with either species diversity or language diversity. We've got variables relating to the size of speaker populations um, and also the population density of every point on the globe and also indicators of biodiversity. So well-described species groups that allow us to map biodiversity. I'm happy to talk about the analysis later on, but for the sake of expedience, I'll go straight to the results. We do indeed find support for the ecological risk hypothesis because mean growing season is the best correlate of language diversity of all of those variables we tested. Um, but it doesn't seem to be because um, all populations are smaller in areas with mean growing season, but the minimum population size of a speak group is lower. So it suggests that a long growing season allows smaller groups to persist. Now, surprisingly, we didn't find any support for the variables representing isolation, the difficulty of movement over the landscape, um, except for river density. Now, river density has previously been suggested as a universal driver of language diversity, uh, the idea being that it chops up um, groups. However, we didn't find any association between average population size and river density, but again, between the minimum viable population size and river density. So it suggests that rivers aren't acting to chop populations up, but like growing season are acting as a resource to allow smaller populations to persist. Okay, so using these kinds of analyses where we allow for relatedness and proximity, we can show that there's no direct connection between biodiversity and language diversity. Instead, it's an indirect link because both of them are uh, associated with the same sorts of environments. So now that we have the patterns of diversity, what can we learn about language endangerment and loss? So there's around 7,000 spoken languages in the world and various estimates are that around half of them are endangered. And to put this in some kind of context, you know, about 40% of amphibian species, about a quarter of mammal species and about 14% of birds, although I think that's a bit higher now, um, are considered endangered. So if you plot la endangered languages on a map, you can see that there are some areas with many more endangered languages, but also these tend to correlate with the areas of high diversity. That's not surprising. If you've got more languages, if there's smaller speaker populations, if there's more of them per unit area, you're going to have more endangered populations, uh, more endangered languages. So instead, if you plot the proportion of languages in a given grid cell that are endangered, you see a very different pattern. And here you can see there's very strong areas of loss around the globe, you know, most notably North America and Australia, um, but others as well. And that tells us that there's some effects on language diversity that affect many different languages in an area. So we want to e explore in as much as we can what some of those variables are. Obviously, we can't um, include all possible influences on language evolution, language endangerment, but we're trying to get a general picture. So we got, constructed a database of about six and a half thousand spoken L1 languages. We were not able to include signed languages because there isn't enough um, information, comparable global information on them. I'd be happy to discuss that afterwards. For a variety of reasons, we use the EGIDS language scale, which is based on intergenerational transmission. Um, and we gathered as many predictive variables as we could. It has to be globally available language uh, data for representing the transmission of language to children, representing the factors that cause people to shift from using their L1 language to another language, and aspects of language policy, as well as the correlates of environment and environmental change. So an overview of these, um, variables. We're gathering uh, information on each language, where it is, how many speakers it has. 
on the kind of landscape it exists in to represent movement over the landscape, whether it's in a country where, that has one of the major world languages as an official language, environmental variables that we know correlate with language diversity, variables representing the degree of biodiversity loss, and also land use such as built environments or agricultural land, and the change in those environments over time. We have socioeconomic markers such as GDP and life expectancy. And as much as possible, we gathered information on educational systems. So this is quite hard to get globally comparable data on. We also use language distribution data to describe how many other languages each language comes into contact with and how many other threatened languages there are in the area. So to cut a long story short, uh, we identified a, a number of globally significant factors that correlate with language endangerment over the whole world. There's also uh, many of the factors are regionally significant. As you'd expect, you're not expecting the same patterns of endangerment over the whole world. Now, I'm not gonna talk about those regional factors, which I think need a lot more analysis, but just to give you some examples. So for example, um, temperature seasonality, climate, it correlates with language endangerment in Europe, uh, whereas cropland correlates with language endangerment in West Africa. So there are regional differences. But today I just want to run through some of those globally significant predictors. So not surprisingly, the greatest predictor of endangerment is whether the language is being learned by children, how many L1 speakers there are. But just to point out that L1 speaker numbers isn't the whole story with language endangerment. You can have languages with a large number of L1 speakers that are endangered because they're not being actively learned by children. And you can have very small languages um, with very few L1 speakers um, that are not endangered because they are actively being learned by children. So here's some examples of languages that are spoken really only in one or two villages in New Guinea and yet are strong and vital because children are learning them. So one of the other predictors around the globe of language endangerment is road density. Now you might think, well, this is just a, a stands for economic development and change in the environment. But we don't think it does because we've got a lot of other variables that represent economic development, um, such as GDP, shift in urban population. And those ones are not significant predictors of language endangerment, but road density is. So we think this probably represents population movement. So roads connect previously isolated, communities to say regional centres, they allow the movement of people for um, employment or school. And this might be why areas of road density have higher rates of language endangerment. It's not just about uh, language contact though, because the number of autochthonous languages that are in contact with the language um, is significantly associated with language endangerment but it's actually a negative association. The more languages in contact, the less endangered a language seems to be. So simply being in contact with other languages is not in itself a threatening process. However, one of the predictors of language endangerment is how many other languages are endangered in the same area. So there are clearly area-wide threats to language diversity. One of those uh, threats that covers um, where there's a shared factor over a whole area is the average years of schooling. So languages in countries with higher average years of schooling have greater rates of language endangerment. Now, I just want to emphasize, we're not saying here that education is bad or that it, education necessarily has to endanger languages, but clearly the fact that there is a correlation between years of schooling and indigenous language loss shows that in some cases, the positive aspects of education are coming at a cost of indigenous language vitality. And if you think this is a slightly odd result, it is actually backed up by micro level scale, uh, community level scales. And in fact, Felicity will talk about uh, this in the Australian context uh, in the second half of this talk. So many of these global or regional predictors are things that will actually change over time. Some of them we can't predict like education policy, but some we can. For example, we can predict if a language 
is not being learned by children, then when the current L1 speakers have died, there will be no more L1 speakers unless something changes. So we can use the age distribution of speakers to predict that demographic shift in L1 speakers. We can use current patterns of land use change to predict future uh, land use change. And we can use models of climate change to predict change environmental variables. So when we do that, we move the world forward 40 years and then 80 years and say, how many languages do we expect to be endangered or to have, been, um, to have gone silent? And we come up with the fairly broad brush but depressing statistic that we're likely to see a tripling of language loss, uh, even just in the next generation. Um, and in particular, um, our broad estimate would be, obviously there's no way that you can come up with precise estimates, but our broad guess would be that we could lose uh, 1500 languages, which might cease to have L1 speakers by the end of the century. Now, most of these currently have little or no documentation, but they do, most of these currently have living L1 speakers. So we still have expert knowledge holders alive for many of these languages. So it's not too late to act, to intervene, to, to support communities, to uh, lessen this uh, fairly horrific future picture of language loss if we don't do enough to um, support communities to encourage um, child learners. Okay, I will now uh, hand over to Felicity, who I thought was coming to you from the Brisbane River, but is actually Yarra side, I think. Yep, no, that's right. So um, I'm actually on Wurundjeri country in uh, Melbourne. Um, but many of you might know that we've just had a very large flood in Brisbane. So uh, uh, looking at uh, a picture of the Brisbane River is quite relevant um, at this particular time. So I'm going to um, zoom in now. So uh, Lindell's talked very broadly about language endangerment across the world. And what I want to do is just look at one specific situation, which Lindell and I, in collaboration with Jacques Roy and uh, a Gringy uh, collaborator, um, Cassandra Algy, have looked um, at. So this is a particular case, um, which I'll describe in a minute, which is uh, Gringy, which is spoken in Australia. So what we're looking at is a case study of language shift across three generations in a single speech community. This is the Gringy speech community to look at which social factors contribute to language endangerment. And we're also going to look at whether all language features are equally prone to loss. So um, we know, for instance, from the literature that production is generally lost faster than comprehension. So speak, people understand a language longer than they speak it. Um, we um, understand from the literature that grammar is more susceptible to uh, language change than words and nouns are easily, more easily adoptable than verbs. So um, in cases of, for instance, borrowing or code switching. Um, so we're going to take a multivariate approach. So this means looking at more than one variable at a time um, and use three different methods for revealing language patterns and language shift and change. Um, so we use uh, discriminant correspondence analysis, DCAs. These aren't specific to biology, but, you know, we're still talking about uh, collaborations between biologists and linguists. But we're interested in this case in looking at the degree to which speakers from different groups, which are defined by particular social factors, have distinct language use. We then use mixed models, which quite a few linguists will be uh, familiar with. So this isn't specific, again, to biology but to look at how these social factors influence patterns of change. And then um, we're interested in using right Fisher models. So these are specific to population um, genetics and this particular method that Jacques Bois has, um, uh, um, uh, I guess, specified for um, languages to compare the relative rates of gain and loss of language variants um, within speaker populations over time. So we are focused on uh, Northern Australia to give a bit of background for people who don't know the situation in post, well, in colonial Australia, let's say. There were 300 to 400 languages um, that were spoken before colonisation. 
Um, there's around 14 now that have been spoken um, uh, continuously since colonization. There's a lot of language revival um, that's going on and some of that is pretty extraordinary actually. Um, and, and the other thing that's going on is um, a, um, a number of newly emerged hybrid varieties. So one of those endangered languages is one that I've worked on uh, for the past 20 years, Gurindji. Okay, so we're in Northern Australia. Uh, let me know if there's any, still problems. So um, Gurindji is quite endangered. There's um, a, an English-based Creole language which is spoken right across Northern Australia. Um, many people, Indigenous people within Northern Australia have shifted to um, this particular Creole language. For Gurindji people, there's um, a new language which has emerged from this, which is called Gurindji Creole, which linguists refer to as a mixed language. So you can see this language change happening within um, the single language community across three generations. So we have someone like Topsy Dodd um, seen here. She's a senior songs woman in the community and someone I've worked extensively on, on the documentation of uh, Gurindji with the grammar, the songs um, and the dictionary. She's bilingual, she speaks Gurindji and Creole, she actually speaks other Indigenous languages as well, and she also code switches between those languages. And that code switching has formed the basis of Gurindji Creole, the mixed language, so her um, daughter and the next generation down, Deborah, um, speaks Gurindji Creole, uh, which is the mixed language coming from the code switching, but speaks it with quite a lot of variable use. Her daughter now, Vikara, um, who is of speaking age, not just a baby still, um, again speaks Gurindji Creole, but with much less um, variable use. So if we think about Gurindji Creole, we can think about it as um, the adoption of some Gurindji words and grammar, some Creole words and grammar. Um, there's some innovative features, and some of those Creole features have actually um, become a little bit lighter or acrylectalized, as we talk, say, um, in contact with English. And there's just quite a lot of variation. So if we look at this sentence, you can see um, a, the big dog slept next to the table. Um, you've got Creole features like dat, um, uh, one, which is an adjectival marker that clearly comes from one in English. You've got bin, a past tense marker, which comes from bean in English. Table is quite obvious. You've also got Gurindji words in there. So you've got wallagul for dog, muggin for sleep. Um, and some innovations. So this innovation here, you've got um, the combination of a locative marker, langa, which comes from a long, ultimately, uh, which is from Creole, and then the Gurindji locative marker, but this double mark construction makes an innovative construction. But then a Gurindji Creole speaker might equally say a sentence like bigaja, so which is a heavier kind of Creole word for big. Um, and they might just use the Gurindji uh, locative marker, for instance, without that Creole locative preposition. Um, so the corpus that we're drawing from is the largest corpus of an, uh, an Australian language um, to date. Um, the data set that we've extracted from this corpus is over 20,000 data points. We've got 78 people um, who are from three generations, who are also coded for the family that they come from, where they live in the community and their exposure to Gurindji and their exposure to Western education. That's a kind of proxy for their exposure to English. We've got 174 variables with a whole bunch of variants. And if you put this um, in comparison, for instance, to a lot of sociolinguistic studies where there's often just single variable study, you can sort of get the, um, the idea of the extent of this study where we're studying 74, 174 variables simultaneously. So we've got production variables um, versus comprehension variables, so things that people have said versus comprehension tests that people have done. Um, lexical variables versus grammatical variables and noun variables versus verb variables to answer some of the questions that I'll get back to. So this particular intergenerational corpus um, partly comes from conversational data, um, but to ensure that speakers have had the opportunity to express um, lexical um, uh, features or morphosyntactic features using their variant of choice, we've also used um, picture prompt books. Uh, so a lot of you might be familiar with frog stories, for instance, um, and also direct and matcher tasks. And I'll give you an example of one of these direct and matcher tasks, partly by way of introducing you to um, uh, our Gurindji collaborator, Cassandra Algie, who's in this video, as well as Samantha Smiler, who was one of the participants. Uh, 
Pero bueno, cada día tiene que apoyar cada uno en esta. Bueno, bueno, luego en Magen, te voy a dar cuenta. Pero mamá no me toca nada, no me toca nada. Okay, so um, so we had a lot of pictures which um, directors then gave sentences to. Um, and I'm picking out this particular picture again of the dog sleeping next to the table. So we can express this using a Gurindji case marker. You can use a Creole preposition or you can use this innovative double marked construction. And in fact, speakers do different things. So some speakers use pattern A where they just use the case marker. Other speakers use pattern B where they just use the Creole preposition. Other speakers use pattern three where they sometimes use the Creole case marker and other times just use the Creole um, preposition. And some speakers use pattern four where they just use the Creole preposition or they just use the double marking. And these patterns are really important. Um, because they form the basis of um, what we've dubbed a lingua type. So recording um, which language variants an individual uses for each language feature is what we call an individual's lingua type. And it's an analogous to an individual's um, genotype. So a genotype doesn't describe the whole um, genome. And in a similar way, the lingua type just uses a broad sample of language features um, in, in, in a way that describes the, um, a sample of the idiolect um, of, a, uh, of a speaker. So unlike classic um, variational sociolinguistic studies, which just track one variable um, at a time, the lingua type provides an unbiased sample of an individual's characteristic pattern of language use um, at a particular point in time. And this allows us to study the process of um, the incorporation of particular language features from la one language into another, um, which we see in this kind of language shift um, context. Um, so getting back to our questions, we're interested in what shapes language change, are the particular kinds of patterns that are predictable, and whether there's particular factors that increase language endangerment and other ones which might preserve um, heritage languages. And we're also interested, if you remember, in the kinds of variants which are prone to loss and language contact. So, for instance, whether um, people understand language longer than um, they speak a language, whether um, they use words um, much longer, for instance, than they can use grammar from a language, and whether they use a lot more nouns. Um, then they might use verbs in, in language change situations. And again, we're using DCA and mixed models, um, which are general statistical modeling, but also right Fisher models that are specific to um, population genetics uh, and um, uh, uh, biology, which is part of the idea of this kind of interdisciplinary work. So let's look at the first analysis, which is the discriminant correspondence analysis. Um, and this particular analysis is allowing us to ask whether speakers from different groups have similar lingua types. Um, and if you have a look um, in this PC space, each speaker's position is determined by their lingua type. Um, and speakers who are closer to each other have similar lingua types. And what we find is all the sort of social demographic um, factors that we've um, tested for has, have a significant influence on language change over time, but the largest influence um, is generation. And this shows a very strong role of peers in shaping um, language variation. So we found that there were 36 um, variables that were shown to uh, differentiate, sorry, generation one, which are the older speakers from generation two, the sort of middle um, speakers, my generation in a sense, and generation three who are the child speakers, and then 51 speakers that differentiated these um, uh, adult speakers from uh, the child speakers here. Okay, so um, then uh, another important question was whether um, social fact, which, which of those social factors affect um, patterns of variant use. And for this, we're using um, mixed models. So the most significant um, finding that we had from this was that um, formal schooling, um, which is conducted in English, this is important, is a significant factor on the loss of Gurindji variants, even amongst the older generations. So even 
grandparents um, who are this uh, generation here um, with a higher level of um, education are more likely to lose um, Gurindji language variants. So this is the G minus. Um, and they're also less likely to use the, the G plus variants. So this is actually quite um, a significant finding. Probably less surprising um, using the mixed modeling is that exposure to Gurindji is a significant factor on um, the retention of Gurindji variants. It's a bit of a no brainer, but if you want to talk about that later, we can talk about it. Um, so now we're using Wright Fisher models, which are specific to biology to determine um, which aspects of Gurindji are most vulnerable to loss and their relative rate of loss. Um, so what's um, particularly interesting in this is that unsurprisingly, um, people, um, the people's ability to speak particular lexical and grammatical um, variables is lost 11 times faster than their ability to understand it. We know this from the literature and this particular finding supports the literature. What doesn't support the literature, which is perhaps more um, interesting and surprising is that it's not, um, uh, uh, th these are non-significant results, is that grammar isn't lost significantly faster than lexicon and that nouns aren't adopted um, faster than verbs. And, and this is kind of surprising, particularly if you have a look at the code switching and borrowing literature. So um, I want to continue a little bit with uh, the right Fisher models because they're specific to um, uh, biology. Um, so one of the questions that we're interested in is, well, yeah, there is language shift going on to Creole. Why is there a greater uptake of some Creole variants? And colonisation is the obvious answer to this. And throughout our talk, we don't want to diminish the um, uh, devastating effects of colonisation. But we, when we drill down to it, we want to ask questions like, why is it that the Creole form for the variable, bu variable butterfly, for instance, um, largely replaces the Gurindji form, which is mully mully, um, but the Gurindji form of the variable dog, Wallagul, which we've seen before, remains really resilient. Um, so one of the questions that um, we had, which we we're looking at within the literature, is that morphological complexity, for instance, often um, is shown to be affected by language contact. Um, so we see a significant reduction in morphological complexity. Um, most of these studies use single, use single variants. And what we're wanting to do with this study, again, is to use multiple variables that are chosen for their factor variation. And this avoids the, the issue of circular argumentation. So picking variables that are um, undergoing simplification, which then demonstrates the story you're trying to tell. So again, we're using Wright Fisher models. And what we're doing is evaluating whether the adoption of elements from either Gurindji or Creole is completely random. Um, or whether it's biased towards one of the parent languages, and we've already seen that it's biased towards Creole, um, or whether it's driven by morphological um, simplification. So if we go back to our example of the dog sitting next to the table, we can code these um, variants, uh, variables for, uh, sorry, these variants for uh, morphological complexity. And I can talk about um, how we coded these later if you're interested. Um, but to, for now, just to say that case, um, in this case, because it's spatial case, was um, coded as being uh, medium level complexity because um, it's uh, not contextual, uh, it's, con um, it's inherent case, um, uh, sorry, inherent inflection. Um, the preposition is coded as low um, complexity because it's um, in the, uh, a single word, it's not part of a complex word, and double marking is actually, sorry, coded as um, medium complexity as well, not high complexity. Again, I'll talk to, I uh, can answer that question a bit later if you have some, some things you want to ask. So the first thing we found is not surprisingly, there's a bias towards Creole. So when you're looking at these pl this plot as it's emerging, Generation one are the oldest adults. I'm going to reveal generation two, the adults, and then um, the children. What you should be looking for here is the proportion of orange, which is Gurindji, changing to the proportion of blue, which is Creole. So you can see that as you go to the adult generation now, so we're getting younger, you see um, proportionally more Creole, which is blue. And again, as the child generation, we see more 
blue, which is again Creole. So there's a clear bias towards Creole, both across the lexicon, which is this um, strip here, and then the, the grammar, which is this strip here. Okay, more interestingly, what we find is there's no bias towards simple variants. So complex Creole variants are frequently adopted rather than their simple Gurindji um, alternatives. Simple Creole variants are almost more like, no, like are also no more likely to be adopted into the contact language Gurindji Creole than complex Creole variants. Um, and complex Gurindji variants also have a greater rate of adoption than both simple and highly uh, complex Creole variants, which is a, a slightly less um, straightforward story. Okay, so in general, there's no um, uh, bias towards simplicity. So just leaving it here and leaving that question a little bit open, I just want to um, uh, conclude in saying that Linguistics has had a long history of using biological methods to map both macro level linguistic variation, which Lindell has talked about, for instance, linguistic diversification and um, all of the pitfalls that have been associated with that a little bit more recently. Wright Fisher evolutionary models have been used in population genetics to map biological variation. Um, and the work that we're doing is really one of the first applications of Wright Fisher evolutionary models to linguistic data. Um, using this kind of modeling does require linguists to scale up and use multiple variables um, and their expression. So to use variants to map across an entire language. So this is our concept of um, a lingua type, and this is a little bit different from traditionally what um, variational linguists have done. But we, when we do use multiple variants, we can avoid some of the pitfalls of some of the theorizing on language change and endangerment when we just use individual variables. For instance, this generalized claim that simplification occurs through contact. Um, so I'm going to leave it there so that we've got time for questions, since I think we've only got about 10 minutes left for questions, but I'll just leave you with um, uh, Jia Hua, who's um, the person who's done most of the mathematical work um, with uh, this um, joint work, um, and also Cassandra Algy, who's um, been really crucial in um, the collection of the Gurindji data for this particular project. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, we're back to the audience. Great, thank you Felicity Lindell for an excellent talk. Very interesting, very informative, very well organized and excellent research you've been doing obviously for many years behind the scenes. Uh, so it's great to see some of the, the pieces of that. We've got time for a discussion, so you can use the raise hand function in Zoom if you'd like. You could also uh, just note in the Zoom chat if you prefer that you'd like to ask a question by writing the word question or put a cue, or you can also write out your question in uh, Zoom. So is there anyone that would like to get us started? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Gisela. Thank you. It's really, really interesting. I don't have English adjectives to express how interesting this was, but I'm intrigued by the fact that the simplicity did not work out as expected. Uh, could it be the case that what is simple for a linguist is not simple for a native speaker? Yeah, so um, what we did with this particular analysis was to specifically address um, the question of morphological simplicity. So um, morphological complexity um, has been looked at from the point of view of both absolute morphological complexity and relative morphological complexity. So I think what you're talking about um, from a speaker's point of view is relative morphological complexity. Um, which is indeed a really interesting question um, and not one that we could answer with the data that we had. So what we looked at was absolute linguistic complexity. So we were looking at, um, for instance, the participation of morphemes within paradigms, um, the participation of um, morphemes as both being inherent um, uh, 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 inflection, uh, for instance, whether they were um, independent words, whether they were part of complex words, that sort of thing. So I think that's a really good question. But what we wanted to do was not um, address specifically what is morphological complexity, because as you, as you note, that's been raised a lot in the literature, but to use existing criteria for absolute morphological complexity and see whether that related to um, language change and endangerment. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
And I'd just like to add in there that um, from a biologist's point of view, I'm pretty sure it's the same for both biologists and linguists that the easiest way to start a fight is mention the word complexity, that <laughs> there's never going to be a, a something that we all agree on. And what we've tried to do with all of these analyses we've been talking about is we've never got a perfect solution. But what we've tried to do is find something that's tractable, something we can do. So in none of the analyses we look at, can we possibly give the whole answer? But we try to find something we can measure, something we can um, put a, a quantitative value to so we can begin to answer that question. But it, it's never satisfying in the sense that we never manage to capture all of the things that we want to in any of these analyses. But it, we try to make a start on it. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, did you have a question? I did, but I'm, I'm nearly out of time. So I, I kind of hesitated in asking it, but I will anyway, just in case. So I really enjoyed this paper as well. And um, I suppose I was hinging on one of the, the last things that Felicity, you were saying, that the pop at variation in sociolinguistics is well warranted here. Um, I, I suppose the, the issue of that, that particular paradigm, right, is that they're trying to understand variation and change through social embedding and evaluation and, you know, things like indexicality. And invariably, you end up having to, to zoom in quite significantly and you lose a lot of this macro detail. And I suppose, I mean, my half-baked question to you would have been, um, do you think that kind of paradigms approach is useful in what you're trying to do in, a, in this particular way, understanding you know, linguistic diversity and loss? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, these kinds of approaches um, you know, have to operate in parallel. So I don't mean to say, you know, to chuck the baby out with the bathwater. No. <laughs> um, but just to say that, what happens often in studies of language change is that we, partic we partic pick sorry, a particular feature and we build a whole story around that feature. And often we pick that particular feature because we can see that there's something going on. And what we're trying to do with this is just pick um, linguistic variables for the, the fact of being variables as opposed to um, particular directions of change mm. and what we're trying to do is come up with a, a more neutral model of this mm. but I guess that then what you want to do is find the things that are really doing something quite interesting um, mm. and then drill down on those and that's actually already what various and so something was are doing so yeah um, like I say we don't want to chuck the baby out with the bath water um, we're just trying to sort of pull back um, from uh, trying to make bigger statements and global statements about mm. um, uh, language change just based on single variables. Mm. No, okay, no, thank you very much. Mm. I, I have my own questions, but if anybody else has a question or comment, I'll give a space for that. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the first study and I'm wondering if you can cut on the uh, predicting language diversity and loss. If you can comment on the difference between your approach to this and the previous approaches, like the um, the LCAT study, the Catalog of Endangered Languages, or the Simons and Lewis study predicting language loss, I, th I think they predicted slightly even higher numbers of language loss over the next century compared to yours. Could you comment on some of the differences, both in methodology and, and results? Well, I, I think there's a number of differences. Um, and. Uh, We've tried to say, what can we learn from the way that people have studied species endangerment that's useful? Now, it's never going to be exactly the same thing and you end up doing something quite different. But we're trying to, for a start, avoid circularity. So this is why we're not using L1 speaker population size or distribution as markers of endangerment. So some previous studies have used um, those as their measure of endangerment, but that's a bit circular. And so uh, we tried to get away from that by using an endangerment scale. Um, but we, you also need to take diversity patterns into account because if you remember, I put up a, a map that shows that the greatest losses of language are the places where they're the most languages. So we need to look for patterns above and beyond that. But I think in some ways we're looking for different things as well. We're looking for the correlates that allow us to predict um, language loss. As far as the actual numbers, I wouldn't take any particular set of numbers as being particularly robust because obviously we can't get a, a forward prediction that's, we're trying to get a probabilistic estimate. So differences in numbers of endangered languages, I think are not something worth uh, getting exercised about. 
because that's going to change if you change the the um, the endangerment scale. If you change the L1 speaker population sizes can't all be accurate because they're constantly changing. So at any given time, we can only take a snapshot. Some languages are known better than others. So I guess what distinguishes our approach is the number of variables that we've included. Um, I'm not aware of any other language endangerment studies that used anything more than say L1 speaker population size or range. So we've tried to include as many factors as we can. Obviously we can't include everything because we can only put in things that we can get globally comparable data for. That's particularly frustrating for things like uh, education policy or for historical factors such as colonization or wars or massacres. Um, the other thing that distinguishes us is there has never been a study that has allowed for the fact that similar languages will be similar in many things, nearby languages will be similar in many things. So you have to take the amount of uh, similarity you get just from being nearby and related, you have to take that into account to look for patterns above and beyond that. Uh, so sorry, I've, I've, I've probably rambled on a bit. Did that answer the question? Yeah, no, definitely. That's great. Uh, Anna, uh, if someone else has a question, do feel free to raise your hand and put it in the chat. But just on, on a related note to that, um, if I'm correct, I think your study relies on the EGIDs ratings pretty heavily. And the uh, 6A, I think, has been stated to be sort of the default one, where if they don't know, they just put it in the default one. So then by default, you know, if we don't have information, the language gets marked as safe. So am I correct that that would sort of make your estimate even cons more conservative of an estimate because of that? Yeah, we've definitely erred on uh, being conservative. And we've at every point in the analysis, we've done that. So, for example, with our future predictions, we've only taken the, the languages that are already endangered and said how much worse situation will they be in future. We haven't allowed any of the languages that are currently stable to enter that. And so you, it, it has to be conservative. And the reason we do that is because we need to have a good basis for making those predictions. Now, if we have an IGID score of seven, what that's telling us is it's not being learned by children. So if you're seven and above, according to the information we have, children are not learning it, you're going to run out of L1 speakers. We can use demographic information. And I would just emphasize this is not proper demography. This is effectively back of the envelope demography. We're using the age structure for regions. We're using the number of L1 speakers. We're making very basic predictions. So a proper demographer with proper information would do this in a much better way. But all we can do is these broad brush um, estimates. And that is why I would emphasize that I wouldn't focus on the numbers. Um, but the broad patterns and the areas of concern. And we all know that um, without intervention, we are going to see a lot of languages go quiet. We wouldn't predict exactly which ones, uh, but we can say it's going to be a lot unless we do something. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that message has really got through enough to people outside the endangered language community yet, mm -hmm. just what kind of language loss crisis we're we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that this helps bring a little bit of attention to the problem we could face in future if we don't do something about it. Mm, great. Uh, Julia, you have a hand raised. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm not feeling great. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Kind of all kind of answered really what I was going to say anyway, thank you, uh, basically about it being broad brush, um, um, because practically every linguist I know says, oh, well, well, ethnologue is, is great, but for the language I'm studying, it's, it's, it's not correct. Um, so I think you can really only take it, as you say, like as, as a broad overview, kind of as an overall in, in indicator. As you say, that a lot of the figures are, I think, are pretty much back of the envelope. There's no reliable, basically, there's no reliable um, definition. What is a speaker, for example? How good do you have to be? Um, that's kind yeah, of and, that, and that, for example, that's one of the, and we know that the L1 speaker numbers aren't great, but what we're doing is we're using the best that we can get our hands on. Uh, and it's clearly not, it's not good enough, but it's the best that we have. And we can go through the database and find examples where it doesn't look right. And there's a few languages where we adjusted it based on other sources, but we simply, unfortunately, one of the costs of doing a global analysis is, 
you're going to lose expert yeah. understanding of each of those languages yeah. because yeah. it would take an expert to look at every single one of them to make that correct. So we hope we're getting a broad picture, but I would never use this sort of analysis to predict the tra trajectory of any particular language. Yeah. And, and it's also there's geographic uh, biases. So for example, the Australian languages, mm. I think, could really do with a lot of um, improving the, the yeah. information on ethanol. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that's partly why we're also pairing this broader work with um, work on at least one and uh, we're expanding this to other um, individual language situations. And there's another question in the, um, uh, the chat from uh, Lidiana about whether speakers, uh, about speakers consciousness. So are they aware of the fact that they're mixing and complexifying language? Um, so just a quick answer to that, which is a preview of work that we're doing currently at the moment. We are looking at sociolinguistic salience as a factor um, in the Gurindji Creole situation about whether people are choosing uh, particular Gurindji or Creole variants over the other. And that's probably the, the closest we can get to answering uh, questions about uh, consciousness, um, not so much around complexifying language, but around variant choice. So that's just a quick answer to that question. Thank you, Felicity. Uh, and George, you have your hand up, then maybe this will be our final question of this session. Okay, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. I just, I just want to say I really, um, I enjoyed both talks and I'm very excited to read um, many of the, the papers. Um, I wanted to go back to the point that we were discussing about, you know, individual languages, uh, the expert versus uh, people who want to do global studies and everything. I'm very appreciative of all the studies, uh, Linda, that, you, that you've conducted. I want to discuss the, um, the EGID scale just a little bit, the endangerment scale. So we are currently, um, so I do work in Indonesia and we're currently challenging the claim that uh, transmission to children is a marker of kind of endangerment. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is that we've found in uh, the island of Alor in Indonesia, as well as other parts of Indonesia and more broadly in Melanesia, the concept of delayed vernacular production, which is that um, the language, the vernacular is not passed on to children, but that the children acquire it in kind of post-adolescence or early adulthood. And this is uh, completely missing from the um, you know, from the language endangerment scales and so on. And we want to kind of find a way to incorporate models like that because we are finding, so I found it for Abui by doing an in-depth study. We also find it in passing in footnotes on various language grammars and so on that the language isn't being passed on to children, but they do end up picking it up and becoming fluent speakers in adulthood. Uh, so we're looking at what effect that can have on endangerment and on language uh, change. That, that's fantastically interesting. I'd love to learn more about that. And uh, again, yeah, there, there is this very strong focus on L1 speakers. And I think one of the reasons that there's a focus on L1 speakers is because it's tractable. It's something that you can point to and say this is their first language, although even in some multilingual communities, identifying exactly which is your L1 might not be straightforward either. Um, and there's uh, again, we you'd emphasize language revitalization. I think there might have once been the idea that if you're not L1, you could never be uh, you know, an L1 speaker. And yet we're now looking at, and especially in Australia, there's a really strong language revitalization movement. Now, of course, they are not going to exactly recreate the language that was spoken a couple of generations ago, but they're going to reclaim language. They're going to reclaim important elements of it. So I agree with you that there's this binary scale, L1, L2, um, and, and it can't represent everything on the ground. Um, and in that case, we need a new way of measuring that and reflecting it in the endangerment status. Now, I'll just say why we used EGIDs as opposed to the other scales that are around. We looked at all of them um, and we, we mapped all of them. And of course, in most cases, they, they agree with each other. The practical reason we used EGIDs is it's available for more more languages. So for something like the UNESCO rating, they tend to only evaluate endangered languages. And we, for our analysis, we need a rating for every language, not just the endangered ones. For something like AES, 
Uh, again, it's just available for fewer languages. And it also, I think they're starting to iron this out now, but there's also some issues with AES where within the language hierarchy where you have umbrella languages or dialects, uh, the AES score sometimes gets, um, so you'll use the score from the higher level to apply to the lower level and things like that. So we just, we did investigate all of these things and we uh, had to choose EGIDs because if we wanted to do a global scale, it was really the only viable option we had. We would have just cut, we would have had a bias sample of languages otherwise. That isn't to say there won't be a better way of doing it in the future. So I would hope that people look at the study we've done and go, well, hang on, that's not right because it's missed this. And then they go out and do it better. So I think we've done a better job than previous because we've brought more in but obviously we haven't brought enough in and obviously there's better ways of doing it. So I hope this is just a stepping stone and we get better analyses after this. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, if you look at individual language situations, uh, the one that you're talking about in particular actually sounds very interesting. So we've just had a study that's actually come out for Gurindji, Gurindji Creole that looks at um, long acquisition. Um, and so what we're trying to do is work out whether um, some features of the language are due to long acquisition or whether they're due to language shift. Um, so that's uh, trying to compare um, uh, uh, actual change over time um, and also looking at snapshots um, at a speaker population. So I'd be happy to um, send you that paper. And as Lendl said, this is all about, um, you know, a situation where languages are being lost, but actually in Australia, there's some really inspiring situations that are going on. I've just been um, down in Northern New South Wales talking to Gumbangia mob. They now have um, a first language acquisition school. I'm so inspired by the work that they're doing down there. The Ngarinjiri and um, Ngarinjiri, sorry, in South Australia are doing similar things. So um, there are L1, L2 speakers who are now emerging from really severe language endangerment situations. So I think we don't want to see this as, um, you know, a, a nail in the coffin, but actually is a real call to arms to um, really throw support at those places where there's enormous amounts of energy and to, um, uh, you know, forestall the process of language silencing and really support languages where um, people are doing enormous amounts of work. Thank you, George, for the question. Thank you, Lindell and Felicity, for agreeing to be with us this morning, this evening, your time. I know it's probably past work hours for you and you're staying extra late to be able to speak to us. Uh, we really appreciate this research. Obviously, very interesting for those of us who study uh, language from multiple different perspectives and has some real chance to have a positive impact on the speakers of these endangered languages as well. So very meaningful work in that sense. So thank you so much for the work you're doing and for sharing with us today. Thank you very much. And please do get in touch if you've got any more questions or want to discuss this further. We're very happy to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks right. for your attention. Thanks, everyone.